It's a great pleasure to talk to Peter Trudgill. Um, Peter, I always start by asking when and where the subject was born. So when and where were you born? I was born in Norwich, uh, more specifically a, a suburb of, of Norwich, and I was born there in 1943. 1943. Yeah. Right. And then Tell me something about as far back as you like your ancestors on either, either side. Well, in, in one sense, it's very easy to tell you about my ancestors because I know for a fact that all 32 of my great, great, great grandparents came from eastern Norfolk. So I'm very <laughs> thoroughbred. Um, or inbred, as some people, as my, as my American wife says. So, uh, and I know pretty well where, um, where they all came from. My, my mother's family came from northern Norfolk and my father's, came, father's family came from southern Norfolk and eastern Norfolk. So the Trudgill name actually originated in the Norfolk-Suffolk border area. So slightly unusual name, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, and it's a, a monogenetic surname. Hmm. Um, everybody called Trudgill is related. And uh, the name seems to go back to someone called uh, William Trodgill or Trodgill, who was living in Harleston in South Norfolk in, I think it was the 1740s. Um, and the name is actually, it, it's fairly clearly a local name because it's an East Anglian dialect form. Um, the name goes back to Threadgold. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's taken uh, me and my family, and particularly my second cousin, a long time to work all this out, but Threadgold is a not uncommon name, mm. and it was a nickname given to men who used to embroider the clerical vestments. So they were indeed threading, mm. threading gold. And uh, so there are, there are lots of people around called Threadgill and Threadgill and so on, but this, the, the thr to tr was a particularly Norfolk dialect or Suffolk dialect form. So it would have been Treadgill or Tridgill or Trodgill. So the Norfolk dialect form of threshing is Troshan to this day. So just as, thr just as thresh is Trosh, so thread was Trod, and I gave you <laughs> Trodgill. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, it takes a linguist to know all this. Um, so having established all those more ancient uh, ancestors, Coming down perhaps to your grandparents, did you know them at all? Yes. Um, I mean, all of those great, great, great grandparents were farm labourers and um, people working in that kind of occupation. I knew my um, paternal and maternal grandparents very well. My mother's family were living in various different villages in North Norfolk, and my father, my grandfather, my mother's father, was a initially a farm labourer, farm steward. Uh, they were a real country family. And my father's family grew up in Norwich. So there's quite, quite a big split in, in the area, or there was, between city people and country people. Mm. It's, it's part of the local consciousness. So my, my paternal grandparents were very much city people. And I think my grandmother came from a family which was very much a a Norwich family. They'd been in the city for many generations. But my grandfather's family, we know that it was my great-grandfather who moved into the city from, from southern Norfolk. But um, they all lived to be into their uh, 80s. My maternal grandmother lived into her 90s, so I, I, I had plenty of time to get, to get to know all of them very well. And what were they doing in Norwich mainly once they'd migrated in? Well, um, I think my paternal great-grandfather um, worked in various occupations. I think he was a coachman at one, one time. But my grandfather himself was, a, was an industrial blacksmith. He used to work at a factory in Norwich which is called Bolton and Pauls, which made um, wire netting, it made fences. Um, when we'd go to the football match we'd walk past a, a particularly long metal fence and he would say, well, I made that. <laughs> he also made the gates uh, between Spain and Gibraltar. They were made in the factory in Norwich. Um, and 
the factory was also bombed um, quite deliberately by the Nazis during the war. So that was all part of the stories I used to hear. My uh, my grandmother, my city grandmother, my paternal grandmother, um, had various working class occupations. I mean, she worked in a in a in a factory from time to time. Um, nothing very grand. Mm. Did, did any of them, do you think, influence you by their interests, hobbies, um, enthusiasms? Or well, in particular, things? my father's parents, the city city grandparents. They were very working class, um, and in fact, uh, my grandmother, I think, grew up in quite considerable poverty. But they were, and this is, you know, this is the 19, 1920s, um, the 1910s, they were working class people who were very socialist and they were very much influenced by the idea that working people had a right to a good education and good culture too. So they used to read a great deal, and my grandfather would talk to me a lot about uh, local history, and even take me and my cousins on walks around the city, around the countryside, show us various historical um, phenomena. So um, I grew up in a house with lots and lots of books. And this was, my mother left school when she was 14, my father left school when he was 16, but there was the idea that books were important, that music was important, that art was important. My father became a rather well-known local artist in his time. Um, and in fact, um, he actually had some connections with King's College, Cambridge, where we are sitting now, because um, starting sweeping the floors in a department store in Norwich, Gerald's department store, it's still there, he gradually worked his way up um, to become a department manager in the, in the store and one day the um, the boss of the company Mr. John Gerald came along and said he wanted my father to start um, a new publishing business because they had a printing works they had a department store and now he wanted a publishing business so that they could publish things printed in the printing works and he particularly wanted my father because he knew of his artistic abilities his, his creative abilities so my father, who'd grown up in a very small terraced house uh, in the middle of Norwich, ended up visiting King's College, for example, and uh, discussing with the fellows guidebooks and, and postcards for the chapel. I'm nodding like this because you can see it out of the window here. <laughs> well, Gerald, of course, is a, a very famous Cambridge name. I mean, there's branches here as well. Yes, it's the same, the same, com the same company, the same family. Mm. Well, moving then to, we've really moved to your parents. Um, we're shaped by our parents. Tell me something about the character and how you think they might have influenced you. Well, as I say, it was, although they had never had a chance themselves in, in education, my father, my, excuse me, my mother um, would easily have gone to a grammar school, but her family couldn't afford it, so she had to leave her country school when she was 14. But they always wanted an education for me and my brother, and I don't remember a time when it wasn't clear to us that the plan was that we, we were going to go to university. I mean, we didn't even question that. Um, so there, were, there was always learning in the house. My mother read enormously. She, she left school without having had much of an education, but she educated herself and my father helped to educate her and um, her parents-in-law were, were very keen that um, there would be lots of books around and so on. And my mother, who is still alive at the age of nearly 94, has until very recently done cryptic crosswords uh, <laughs> very well and uh, very eagerly. So there was always this sort of intellectual mm. edge uh, to this lower middle class household. So uh, the idea was that we were going to be educated and we were going to do as well as we could. And, then, and you seem to have got on well with both of them. I mean, you admired them and liked them. Yes, yes. Um, they were very different people. They were, they were city and country, mm. which as I've said in those days in Norfolk was quite a big difference. My father was very creative, very artistic, um, rather... Um, 
nervous, um, slightly edgy, rather tense, but a lovely man. Everybody, when they remember him now, talks about him being very gentle. He was a very gentle man. Uh, my mother was the organiser. She would keep my father's feet on the ground when he was having some of his fanciful ideas. And uh, she, she was very much the one who decided what was going on in, in our family. She had a husband and two sons, um, but she was, she was pretty much in charge. And yes, I was, I was very fond of both of them, I still am, um, particularly in remembering my father. My mother is, as I say, still alive, and I've become very close to her recently because she's unfortunately um, um, suffering from dementia. And so, but the important thing that I can do for her is to go and sit and talk to her about the old days because there are very few other people around who remember the old days. So that's what my mother and I have in common now. We sit and talk about the old days and it's, it's distressing, but it's a great pleasure. Mm. Is there anything about your family? I'm always looking for hints of the future career, you as a sociolinguist. I mean, you pointed to the opposition of city and country. Was there any kind of linguistic um, Yes, there was. There was. Um, I mean, I, I, I only see this now in retrospect, of course. But um, my grandparents in the country were typical speakers of the, typical speakers of the Norfolk rural dialect. Um, whereas my other grandparents were typical speakers of the urban city dialect, and they were quite different. I dare say outsiders wouldn't hear the difference, but we were sensitive to them. And in particular, um, my mother used to talk about it a lot, because she moved in from the country, from the village, to get a job in the city. She met my father, and then he took her home to meet his parents, and they, they would laugh at her. They would laugh at her for the way she spoke. So uh, they would. There was this particular phrase they used to use to tease her, which was "hundreds and hundreds and naked women," because there was a, a, Norfolk, a North Norfolk dialect feature was, uh, and still is, that people say things like "hundred" rather than "hundred." She, on the other hand, despised them for the way they spoke, but she was too young and too polite mm. to tease them. I say despise, no, that's too strong, but she used to look down on them. Mm. And what she would always say, she would say, Norwich people drop their H's, <laughs> which is quite true. Yeah. And it's true to this day that you have this linguistic innovation spreading outwards from London, which gets to the urban area, but doesn't or hasn't yet spread out into the, into the countryside. So whereas she said hundred, mm. they used to say hundred. <laughs> and, and each party would tease the other one about it, or would actually notice that the other one did that. So that was an early linguistic experience for me. Um, a sort of a, a certain degree of consciousness about uh, language. But I, I don't think I really got interested in... There's other, I mean, I do, there must have been something there, because I do remember experiences which I didn't understand at the time, which have now become clear to me, which are to do with language. So I remember at um, uh, junior school when I was perhaps seven, um, the teacher asking the class what language the Romans spoke. And you know, there were kids in the class who said Romans and Roman and others who said Italian and I knew it was Latin. So I, 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 and I got lots of credit for that. Uh, and I also remember a particular school teacher correcting somebody when they were reading. And the particular example is quite instructive. The, and I remember the example to this day. Uh, the word was road, R-O-A-D. And in Norfolk, people say rude. Um, I still say rude if I'm uh, in the appropriate environment. But the teacher heard it as rude, R-U-D-E. So that, that, I mean, they're clearly different to local people, rude and rude. But the child in my class said rude, a teacher heard it as rude and she she kept saying no it's not rude it's road and and for us road meant what you do when you're rowing a when you're rowing a boot you row a boat like <laughs> so there's misunderstanding all around and i remember that i had no idea what the misunderstanding was until later on when i cleared it up but basically i think i remember getting really interested in language 
when I was about 12. And that was at the end of my first year in grammar school when the following year we were going to, we'd already been doing French, but we were going to start doing German. And I was, I remember I was off school ill with a bad sore throat and um, the mother of one of my friends who lived around the corner gave me or lent me while I was at home her German uh, school book that she'd had when she was at school and I started reading the German and I was absolutely fascinated because it was very clear there was all these correspondences between English and German you know German water was Wasser and ten was zehn and uh, um, penny was pfennig and so on. You know, how, did, how did this come about? And I thought that was truly um, fascinating and I wanted to know more. And I think it was the same year we actually went on holiday with my mother and father to North Wales where people were very much speaking Welsh at the time. And I remember being very struck by that and in fact noticing that while English and German seemed to be very similar, English and Welsh spoken in the same country were utterly different. So then I set up this question in my mind as to why that was and how that happened. So that's the beginnings of an interest in language. Good. Well, let, let's go back to your primary school. Um, that was in Norwich. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything about it at all? Oh, I remember it very well, yes. Um, I went to... Uh, I, I, I first went to school when I was actually four. That wasn't kindergarten, it was real school. Um, I, I was five two months later, but this would have been in 19, 1948. Mm. So very much just after the war. Mm. And um, the school we went to was a, a, an outpost of a larger school about a mile away, and it was just a, basically a hut. Um, with two rooms in it. it. Seemed all right to me, although I do remember wondering why I didn't have any curtains when I first went. But yes, I, I, rem I remember uh, the first two years there, and then the next uh, two years being at the actual bigger school, and then there was a new school opened nearer to where we lived, and I, so I went to three different junior schools, but they're all very much in the same suburb of Norwich, Thorpe St Andrew. Were all the children roughly from your sort of background, or did you have any bullying because of? Difference? No, we were. There was no real bullying for social reasons. It's all people were pretty much all from a. Um, it was lower middle class, upper working class sort of mm. territory. Um, there were people who lived on in council houses, mm. but they were very nice council houses. So I, I, I do remember. I mean, there were people. In the late 1940s, there were there were pupils who really didn't have very nice clothes, mm. um, but there wasn't a wasn't a very broad social mix. Mm. At that age, sort of seven, eight, um, do you do you remember having any particular hobbies? Were you a, a bird's egg collector or a stamp collector or a fanatic at some any games? I was very keen on football and cricket. Yes, mm. particularly cricket. So um, those were my main interests, and um, if, you, if you've grown up in Norwich, you have to be interested in Norwich City. <laughs> and I was, and I still am. Um, but I was particularly fascinated by cricket, and I used to read lots of cricket books. So one of my favorite books in the 1950s was a book about the body line test series between England and Australia in 1932 and 33. <laughs> so, there I was reading about sporting events which had happened 20 years previously, but I was, I was really very fascinated by that. Mm. And then you, you obviously had to take the 11 plus. That's right, I was part of the state school system, I took the 11 plus. Um, I passed, although we were told that we mustn't say pass, it was just about, just about sorting out children into their most suitable form of education. <laughs> we, all saw through, we all saw through that, I mean, that was, they were trying to pull the wool over our eyes, but we were not deceived. It was passing and failing. Mm. And um, I remember even then thinking it was a hateful system mm. because some of my friends were sent off to a school which we all knew was not as good as going to the grammar school. 
Was it Norwich Grammar School? Or what um, was it called? The, the way it worked, um, there were two boys' grammar schools actually in Norwich. Um, one of them was a state grammar school that I went to, City of Norwich School, and the other one was what was in those days a direct grant school, mm. the King Edward VI school, but mm. everybody in Norwich called it the grammar school. I think mm. we still do. So um, it, it did also take pupils who hadn't passed mm. um, if they were able to pay. And I was rather fortunate, I think, because in those days Norwich was an independent entity and I didn't actually live in Norwich. I lived just outside the city boundary. So I wasn't, strictly speaking, eligible to go to the city of Norwich School, but they did allow, the city did allow a certain number of um, county boys to go every year and I was one of the ones who was lucky. It was uh, single sex. Uh, it was single sex, yes. Mm. And another thing which I, I regret. Mm. Was it a, a good school? Teaching it was. It was a. It was a very good school if you were very good. It was a. It was a very elitist school. I mean, not only were we within the, you know, the grammar school was an elite organisation compared to the so-called secondary modern schools, but within the school, um, there was lots of streaming, and I do remember that the bottom two streams were called X and Y, <laughs> as if to rub it in that uh, the, these were um, the bottom of the heap. If you were good at music, there was an excellent school orchestra which I played in. If you were good at sport, uh, lots of attention was paid to you and the the sporting teams were, did very well and in fact the, the old boys football team actually one year progressed uh, a rather a surprisingly long way in the FA Amateur Cup. <laughs> um, but uh, if, you, if you weren't very good, well you weren't ignored but I don't think you had such a good education. You mentioned two sort of interests you had by then. Uh, music. You played an instrument? Or? I did. I, um, at my mother's urging, I had piano lessons when I was a eight, nine, ten. I didn't enjoy them very much. But I, I did fall in love with classical music when I was about eleven or twelve. Mm -hmm. And we were given, those of you who were, you see, those of you who were deemed to be good at music, at the age of 11 or 12 were given the chance of learning an instrument and we were asked what instrument would you like to learn so by a process of elimination I hit on the cello and I said I'd like to learn the cello please so I did um, it was you know, a wonderful system which I don't think is uh, available now but I was supplied with a cello I was supplied with a teacher I uh, had lessons every week and I ended up playing on the first desk of the English Schools Music Association Orchestra um, in the 1960s. Do you still play? No, I don't. I regret. No. Mm -hmm. I used to pick up the cello once a year and play it, and last time I tried I couldn't. <laughs> but your love of classical music has continued, presumably? Yes, it has, very much so. Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of my interests, one of my hobbies, if you like. Mm. Um, and who are the Desert Island disc um, choices of um, which? Oh, if I had, well, yes, we've all thought about that, haven't we? <laughs> um, I, I would certainly have some Bach and I would have some Mendelssohn. Dvořák's cello concerto would mm. be on there. But there would also be some pop music, particularly from the, the late 1950s, early 1960s. Mm. Things that remind one of one's youth. Mm. And is, is music something that uh, um, affects your work at all. Some people are find it either relaxing or inspiring to listen to music before or after work or during work. Does, does it affect you at all? Uh, yes, it does. I, I find it inspiring. In fact, I like to have music on when I'm reading and I like to have music on when I'm writing. Gosh. Um, my wife is very different. We, we, we don't agree about that at all. She can't read and listen to music at the same mm. time. And I understand that. But yes, I, I, I find music helpful. Mm. I mean, some writers like um, well, F. W. Maitland, for example, it's claimed that you can see the music they're listening to by looking at their prose because the rhythm of the writing changes with them. Do you think that affects you? I, I don't think so, no. I, I, th I think what it does is, when I, um, when I get to a tricky bit, I stop and listen rather than mm. gazing out of the window and letting my thoughts wander just anywhere. Mm. Were there any other 
hobbies or interests you were taking up in sort of your early teens, mid-teens? No, I don't. I don't think so. No, I mean that was that was. I used to read. Hmm. I used to listen to music. I used to play music, and I used to follow cricket and football. Hmm. What were you reading at that time? I mean, not the set books, but other. Yes. I, well, I I seem to remember that uh, I I read everything I could lay my hands on really in the local library. We, I was very fortunate when I was about 10. A local branch of the library was open near where I lived, Norfolk County Council Library. Uh, it was open all day, every day. It was open in the evenings. I used to go once a week and take books out. Uh, fiction and non-fiction. And I do remember, going back to the language theme, I do remember, again when I was 13 or 14, taking one by one, all the books about language out of the library, you know, a, a grammar of Burmese, or something. <laughs> and because I was just fascinated by the difference between languages, and I actually compiled a notebook of information about these different languages. As far as literature is concerned, well, I, another thing I remember um, taking out of the library was books about uh, the war, and in particular about. Uh, British prisoners of war and particularly escapes, escaped prisoners of war. That was a big theme for me. But when I actually started um, thinking more about literature as such, so I, this would be when I was about 15 or so, our English teacher at school would talk to us about what we ought to read. And I remember reading Hemingway and Aldous Huxley with, with some considerable uh, enjoyment at that time. And then when we got to be in the sixth form, 17, 18, 19 years old, uh, Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet, for example, is something I, I worked my way through. Mm. Were you, um, I mean, you, you were beginning to, not exactly streaming, but I mean, choosing a subject that you presumably went towards the arts and... Yes, the, the system we had at our school is that you were supposed to choose three uh, subjects that a level, um, and I selected to do French and German and music. Uh, the interest in music was clear. And you you asked about my hobbies. I I, I, forg I should have also thought to say that when I was a teenager, one of my hobbies was writing music. Mm. I used to demand um, music paper for every birthday and Christmas, and I would write string quartets and concertos and so on. Um, and that, that I really loved doing that. So I wanted to do music, to study harmony and counterpoint and so on, and the history of music. And I studied French and German, I now realise, because I was fascinated with languages, and that was all you could do. I, I could have done Latin, but I wasn't very good at Latin. So I ended up in the sixth form, um, translating into and out of French and German, reading French and German literature, and I wasn't very good at any of those things, but I got good enough uh, A-level marks to actually be admitted to King's College, Cambridge, um, as, as an undergraduate. Uh, so, and as far as the music was concerned, I had to, I had to take uh, grade eight on the cello, and I, I, I passed that as part of the A-level exam. And I had thought about maybe going to say the Royal College of Music to study the cello but um, in the end I decided not to do that because I clearly wasn't good enough I was, I was pretty good for a, um, for somebody from our school but I was never going to make it as a professional musician so I went the university language route even though um, French A level and German A level were not really something I enjoyed terribly much but they were my contact with language Do you remember any teachers uh, who particularly influenced you or inspired you? Yes, I, I do. I, um, I remember my, my English teacher, so up to the age of 16, Mr. Geoffrey Carter. Um, he was actually a very good teacher and he, um, he told me that I was a good writer. I was, I was good at writing the essays that one had to write. He, and he, he didn't let me get to that, that went to my head a little bit, I think, <laughs> and I started getting a bit too self-indulgent, and then he, he calmed me down and said that this was far too flowery and, 
I uh, shouldn't do that. And as I say, he encouraged us with the reading. And there's, there were particular, uh, particularly a, a German teacher called uh, Jeff Harvey, who was, he treated us like adults and he was a intellectual and he worked on the assumption that we were as well. And we discussed all sorts of issues, politics um, and society, as, as well as the literature and language we were supposed to be studying. Yes, I look back on them very fondly. Were you beginning to get a sort of mini version of university? In other words, you'd have more towards the end of your time, much more supervision type arrangements. You'd, you'd be sent off to the library to do an essay and then discuss it with the teacher. Not so much like that, no, but we, we were taught in um, uh, rather small A-level classes mm. and um, there were sessions that we would have which were nothing to do with our A-level subjects where there was rather more discussion. An interesting thing that happened to lots of my contemporaries and me was that it was traditional in our school to do, if you wanted to go to Oxford and Cambridge, you did three years in the sixth form. So you did your A-levels and then you applied to Oxford and Cambridge when you already had your A-level results and you did entrance exams in the autumn uh, following your A-level exams. Um, which is what I did, and then you had six or seven months where you really didn't have anything to do. And of course we could have left school, it never occurred to me, I didn't want to leave school, I was, I was very happy. So I stayed at school, I um, uh, played in the orchestra, I played in other orchestras, I went on hitchhiking trips around Europe on my own, went to the headmaster and said, I want to improve my German, I, I pr proposed to take three weeks off and go, go hitchhiking around northern Germany, fine, of course you can do that. And also we used to sit in the, um, the prefect's room, um, 15, 20 of us. We, we had no classes to go to except occasional things that the headmaster laid on, and I had uh, cello lessons and so on. But we used to sit there and read and talk about what we were reading. Poetry, uh, drama, it was... I, I learnt Italian um, to a certain extent. We, it was just a wonderful experience that we had several months where we could do whatever we liked. Mm, sounds lovely. Yeah. I don't know what, we didn't talk about your family's religious background, but um, 15, 16 is when in certain people's lives they come up for confirmation and um, 16, 17, 18 is often when they go through a sort of religious phase or uh, transition. Um, so turning to the question of religion, what, what was your family background? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I don't have any stories like that to tell. My, um, my mother's country family had been uh, good church-going people, uh, Church of England, typical English country village, um, and they would go most Sundays. Except I think, as I recall, uh, my grandfather didn't go. He would stay, he would stay at home. Um, but my grandmother and my mother and her two brothers would go, often walking quite long distances to go to church. But then when she uh, moved to Norwich in the, in the 1930s, I, th I think she stopped going. My father's family were anti-religion. Um, I don't know whether I can say they were atheists, I don't think they were, but they were, they were against organised religion. They saw it as part of the hierarchy, the social hierarchy. Um, and uh, my, my father, for example, my father was born in 1916, but he was not christened, he was not baptised. Uh, so that was very different. So my father, I, I, he was kind of a pantheist. I mean, he believed in something, he wasn't quite sure what it was. And I think my mother, to this day, uh, believes. But there was um, never much religion in, in the family. I, I think I remember my mother encouraging us to say prayers. Um, and I do remember once some of my friends were going to Sunday school and I said, I want to go to Sunday school. And my father said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, well, if you really want to go to Sunday school, you can go to Sunday school. And he took me one day to a nearby Sunday school and he waited outside. And, and I came out and he said, did you like that? And I said, no. And he said, I didn't think you would. And that was, that was as far as it went. So, um, and then uh, 
There, there were no religious experiences. We never went to church. It wasn't even discussed really very much. You weren't confirmed? No. There were, in my class, my class at my, my grammar school, there were 32 of us. One boy was Jewish. Um, I think two were Catholics. And of the rest of us, two got confirmed. And they were much ridiculed for doing this. This was considered an extremely odd thing to, to happen to, to you. So it wasn't a religious environment I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And since then? I, I don't have any different feelings about it, really. No, I, I've never been interested in religion. Um, it seems to me to be fairly preposterous, and uh, I, I have no religious beliefs. I mean, it would be nice to think that there was an afterlife, but I, I, I haven't persuaded myself that that is the, that is the case. No, but are you anti-religious? I mean, are you a Dawkins? Um, well, I'm not anti, I mean, I'm not anti-religious as such, but one can't help, and I, obviously I believe that what Richard Dawkins says from the point of view of uh, science is, is true. And you can't help noticing all the unfortunate consequences that religion's having around the world mm -hmm. right now. Of course, it also has very good consequences. Mm -hmm. But um, there are far too many people who might technically be called religious loonies around uh, having, having an influence on, on the way our world is going at the moment. Right, let's come to... King's College, Cambridge. Uh, who interviewed you? Do you remember? Or who took you in? If you can't remember that fact, I'm not sure. Um, I I I think it must might have been Broadbent. Oh yes. John Broadbent was, I think, senior tutor. I think. Senior tutor, admissions tutor. I think it might have been him that uh, interviewed me. Um, I remember being interviewed just over there in the Gibbs Building. Um, but I don't remember very much about it. Mm. And then who were your main teachers? Well, my director of studies here was uh, Robert Bolgar mm. when I first arrived. And uh, he directed me towards the French lectures and the German lectures that I should go to. And he was actually my supervisor during my first year here. Mm. And um, I mean, a number of things. I, I remember, I'm very grateful to have been here for those three years, but I remember feeling, not feeling very much a part of the place. It was such an alien environment. Mm. You come from a, a state grammar school in Norfolk and you end up here. And uh, just about everybody on my corridor in the, in the garden hostel were um, from old Etonians. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, they, it, it was, they were like an alien species as far as I was concerned. I mean, terribly nice, mm. but um, there seemed to be, you know, nothing to talk about. Mm. I mean, one thing that... Uh, so there, were, there was the grammar school boys and there was the, there was the public school boys. And all my friends here were grammar school boys. Were they? Mm. It really was a huge gap. Well, they may have been in my mind, but I mean, one couldn't help noticing in our year that nearly all the... The groups of friends were either one or the other. I mean, there was some mm. some uh, interaction, but but not a great deal. This is 1963. 1963, 64 was my first year. Mm. Yeah, yeah. May have been a peculiarity of our year, mm. but uh, I remember this same Jeff Harvey, the German teacher um, at, at the City of Norwich School, saying that when you get up to Cambridge, you'll find there's a lot of public school boys bouncing. And he said, you've just got to let them bounce. <laughs> you did let them bounce. Mm. Yes. I mean, by the end of your three years, was there more mixing between, or was it, did it continue right through? There was more mixing, I suppose, and, and that was probably down to the fact we'd got to know each other yeah. better. And, um, uh, yes, I mean, there, there, there were some friendships here. And I remember particularly fondly uh, Edward Littleton, Mm. who was uh, an old Etonian mm. and from the, the Littleton family who was a most uh, delightful chap mm. and I, I, I remember his friendship very well but I mean I have to say that I, I, I didn't take advantage of um, what was on offer I, I could have joined the college orchestra but I never did mm. I didn't even inquire about it mm. I didn't feel integrated enough into the whole fabric of the place to 
to do that. Well, we, in the end, my friends and I, grammar school boys, we ended up not going to hall, going out to restaurants every night, going to the pub. And, you know, we had our own little world there, our own little niche there with people we thought were normal. Mm. And of course, we thought that the, we most certainly didn't think the public school boys were normal. Mm. Very interesting. I remember mm. I had that picture. I was at Oxford at the same time, and half my friends were grammar school boys and mm. half were public. Yeah. But it was a small college and, yes. and didn't have all these elderly tenions. Um, in terms of lectures or teachers, do you remember any who stood out as inspiring you? Well, uh, to start with, no. Because <laughs> I was very, and that was my fault, because I was very much a fish out of water um, academically. You know, I would. Um, Robert Bolgo was a lovely man, mm-hmm. a very, very kind man, very humane man, and um, he did his best with me. But I remember, t- particularly with French literature, you know, we would be given a novel or a play to read, and then the following week we were supposed to go back with an essay written on this book, and um, I was hopeless. I mean, I had no idea. I, I was studying French because I was interested in languages. Mm. And there I was having to to write essays on mm. on eighteenth um, century French novels, and I, I had no idea what to do. Really, I, I didn't like it. I wasn't any good at it. I wasn't a good practical linguist. My translations, my essays in French and German were very poor. And so, for, as far as the lecturers were concerned, I mean, I, I really appreciated being told by Bolgar, "Go to that lecture. Don't go to that lecture. Go to this lecture and see if you mm. like it." I thought that was. A wonderful approach, um, but it, it I, I was happy enough, I mean I had friends here and uh, I enjoyed the social side of things, but I wasn't doing particularly well I think, and if I remember right in part one exams I think I got a lower second, and then I discovered linguistics. I mean probably hard for people to realize that these days but there I was I'd been interested in linguistics all my life but I Mm. didn't know there was such a thing Mm. and I certainly didn't know you could study it and I was getting when I started my second year so this is October Mm. of my second year I suppose uh, I happened to be wandering around the modern languages library and I saw this book lying on the table and it was open at a page with a dialect map in it that caught my eye and I started reading it, and I thought, well, this is really interesting. It was called A Course in Modern Linguistics. Linguistics, well, that, that sounds like it might be interesting. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I was talking to another, I mean, I didn't, I didn't learn anything from, I didn't, I, I never, I, I should have asked, I should have asked Bolgar for his advice. Mm. I, I never did that. I was too diffident, I think. Mm. But I talked to other students and uh, they said, well, yes, there's, there's a course, it's a course called General Linguistics. You can do that as, as a paper. And I investigated it a little bit. I don't remember how I did that now, but I was thinking about this when Bolgar assigned me the novel by Huismos called A Rebours to read. How do you spell that? A Rebours. Um, a, A, mm. letter A, and then R E B O U R S. Mm. Um, it's a famous novel, and mm. people, lovers of French literature, say that it's you know it's very important and so on. And I bought the book. You recall in those days, very often with French books, you had to slit the pages. Yes, yes. And I went back to my room, Unum Terrace, and I slit the first two or three pages, and I started reading it. And I was overcome by this very powerful feeling that I was, I did not want to read that book. And I said to myself, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> I am not going to read this book. So I plucked up courage. I, I, I was, as I said, I was very, at least in this environment, I was very diffident. I plucked up courage to go and see Dr. Bolga, just here in the Gibbs building. And Mr. Trudgill, what can I do, do for you? And I said, well, um, I'm thinking of giving up French literature. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Trudgill, I think that would be a very good idea. 
confirming everything I thought about my abilities, and I said, I'd like to do general linguistics. He said, that's excellent. Go and see, I forget who he sent me to, but he sent me to somebody, and I started having uh, supervisions in, in linguistics instead. And then, then I started feeling happy. Um, John Trim in the linguistics department was my first supervisor, and uh, I went to linguistics lectures, and I suddenly realized there were other papers I could do. So I dropped all the literature papers I could, and I ended up doing general linguistics, the history of the English language, the history of the French language, the history of the German language. And then um, I ended up doing one literature paper, uh, modern German literature, which modern meant up to uh, 1945. And then I had to do, for my finals, I had to do German translations and a German essay. But that was when my life turned uh, when I discovered there was this thing called linguistics and I really wish somebody told me before but my teachers at school didn't tell me because they, they didn't know either. Mm. And how did you get on in your finals? I, I, I think I did pretty well. I, I got enough a second mm. and I think I did well on the linguistics papers. Um, I, my guess, I mean we weren't told the marks in those days but my guess is that the German literature paper wasn't so good and that the German language, the translations and the essay weren't very good either. I, I knew that I would be absolutely hopeless at writing a German essay. So I found a, a book in the bookshop which was called How to Write a German Essay. <laughs> and in it, it had one chapter which was devoted to uh, German um, conjunctions and German phrases German discourse markers, as we'd now say. So all these little phrases like on the one hand but on the other hand, and um, and I learnt, I learnt them off by heart. And I got into the exam room and I wrote down this list of phrases that would be useful in writing an essay. And then I proceeded to write an essay, putting one of these in every so often at a, a judiciously chosen point, and I ended up with an essay which wasn't very good but at least looked like a German essay. <laughs> that was the only way I could think of um, writing a German essay. I'm not proud of it but at, uh, at least I got my degree. <laughs> and what else were you doing? I mean apart from going out for meals in the pub, were, were you um, involved in uh, politics or um, any... any no, no. Um, girlfriend or...? I had a girlfriend um, in Norwich mm. and um, these days, if you had a girlfriend in Norwich and you ended up in Cambridge, you'd probably end up um, dropping her and getting a girlfriend in Cambridge. Mm. But, of there course, that didn't girls. happen because there weren't any girls. Yeah. Uh, but cinema or play? Yes, we, or? Used to go to, we used to go to the cinema. Um, we used to, you know, the, 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 French, the French movies, the, mm. the Italian films. Yeah, mm. we'd do that. Uh, but I think the most educational thing that we did was to sit around talking mm. in other people's rooms, listening to music, staying up all night listening to Muhammad Ali boxing. Uh, but I, I think I learnt, as some very good teachers here, but I learnt more about life and literature and politics and art from my fellow students. Mm. Particularly, I think it was important that um, quite a lot of my friends here were Jewish. Mm. And they were from London, they were from Birmingham, they were very cosmopolitan, they were very um, educated, they were very articulate. So there would be four of us in particular sitting around and they would say, why doesn't Peter ever say anything? And that's because Peter couldn't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> By the time I decided what I was going to say, you know, they, they'd gone on to something else. So that was, if I'm at all articulate today, I think that's because of because of them, and I'm I'm very grateful to them uh, for it. Um, very good friend here, um, David Sweden, mm. sadly died a few years ago. He was he was into politics and economics, and I think I learnt as much from him as I did from from anybody, just through visiting his home in London, just through uh, talking to him and arguing with him. And another friend, Andrew Wernick, mm. who. Uh, is in, sort of into a political theorist now, um, who I'm still in touch with and who also influenced me enormously. 
I remember um, sitting in room in the garden hostel in my first year and somebody came round, um, a student came round, knocked at the door on some kind of political campaign, uh, wanted us to join something or other and they sent him away and David looked at Andrew and said, trot. And Andrew said, yes. I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but no, it was from the, the Trotskyite wing of whatever political organisation it was here in Cambridge. So I was... Uh, I wasn't ignorant, I wasn't unsophisticated, but there were all sorts of things that uh, I didn't know about that I learnt, learnt about from them. So what was I doing? I was sitting around in people's rooms uh, talking, also travelling in the vacations. Mm. I was very keen on travelling. I used to hitchhike around a lot with, with girlfriend, with other mm. friends. I, on one occasion I hitchhiked to Athens and came back via Vienna and Berlin. That was very educational. Mm. Were there any um, any of the fellows of King's View got to know at all or influenced you? I mean, I suppose Eric Hobsbawm must have been here, perhaps. I suppose he was, but um, I, um, that Ed passed me Edmund by. Edmund Leach must have been. He was here, but you, I, I go back to my diffidence and the, the mm. kind of collective feeling that many of us had that we mm. really didn't belong here. So mm. I, I never... Um, I really never talked very much to fellows and, unless I had to. Mm. Um, I remember talking to Dr. Munby, who was the uh, librarian, mm. who was very helpful. Um, Alec Vidler was the dean. He would have sherry parties and we'd go. But to be honest, we'd, we'd sort of sidle out as quickly as we can and as quickly as we could and go down the pub. Uh, Ken Polak was somebody mm. who was I um, remember talking to with some pleasure. Mm. Um, but in the end, it was mostly the the lecturers who were teaching linguistics that I that I came to know. One particular person who really influenced me a lot was somebody at uh, Clare College, he was a fellow at Clare, mm. who was a French linguist, linguist of French, called Jim Laidlaw, mm. um, who later went on to Aberdeen, I think it was. And he did one very important thing to me, for me, because after all I was only here for three years and then I was lucky enough to um, go to Edinburgh University. I can tell you the story mm. of that later if you like. But in my second year at Edinburgh I was starting on a PhD and I didn't have any money. Um, I'd had a state studentship up until then but um, I'd been unsuccessful in applying for a state studentship so I in those days, if you didn't have any money, you could still carry on. There were no fees, and your mother and father might help you with a bit of pocket money, and you might get a bit of work. So it must have been about um, October, in my first year of my PhD studies, I wrote to Jim Laidlaw just to say, I don't know why I did it, I wasn't thinking about any advantage to myself, but I wrote and said, I just want you to know that I've actually been accepted to do a doctorate at Edinburgh University in linguistics, and I want to say to you that I think that's quite a lot of that is do to you and so thank you very much and I must have said I didn't have any money he wrote back immediately and said well you haven't got any money why don't you write to Kings and ask them they'll give you they might give you some money it never occurred to me mm. I mean why would King's College Cambridge give me money to study at Edinburgh University so I wrote to Ken Polak and he wrote back and said yes of course we will give you a, a year's grant to uh, work on your PhD and then maybe, hopefully, at the end of that year, Edinburgh University will come up with some money of their own. Yes. So, it was wonderful. So, if I'm grateful to King's College, it, it's, it's for that. Um, I would not be sitting here if I think they hadn't given me um, the money to actually get into my PhD studentship. So, that was a wonderful thing to do. I'm seeing Ken's widow on Monday, so I'll... Rosemary, so I will tell her... Will you please thank her? <laughs> yes, yes, I... I, you know, I can't say thank you enough to, <laughs> to Kings for that. And Forster, Ian Forster, who was portraits all around the wall yeah. behind you, you, you sort of saw him and nodded. Yes, he, he would pass us here in the, in, mm. the, in the quad here, and uh, he would always smile. And some of my braver friends, mm. as I said, I was this diffident mm. Norfolk teenager, right? and I'd do things like that. But my, some of my friends would stop and talk to him, and then I would listen. And... Um, I don't remember what, what they talked about, but uh, he was uh, very, very charming. Mm. 
Let's move on um, the last part of this session to, to Edinburgh. Um, you went on to do a, a PhD in linguistics? I yes, I mean, the thing about uh, linguistics was, at, at that time, you know, I, I studied as much as I could here in Cambridge, but that wasn't very much, really, of actual modern mm -hmm. linguistics. So the typical thing then for students who were doing linguistics was to go on and do a, an MA, mm -hmm. uh, a one-year taught MA to sort of uh, get up to scratch with what would have been degree level, really. Mm -hmm. So um, I applied for a state studentship to do an MA in London, which is where I wanted to go, all my friends were there, and another one for to do an MA in Edinburgh, uh, the difference being that London was a two-year course and Edinburgh was a one-year course. And when I got, um, I was only given a one-year grant, so I had to go to Edinburgh, and I was a bit disappointed. But of course it was, it was a splendid thing to happen to me because the linguistics department in Edinburgh was probably the best in the country That's at, at that time. Was. That's right, John Lyons was there. Yeah. Yes, and he, he, I'd, I'd taken lectures from him here in Cambridge. Uh, when I started doing linguistics, he just left and gone to Edinburgh, but there was a period when he came down once a week and gave lectures. Mm. And you said, were, were there lectures that I was, that I actually remember? Yes, I remember John Lyons' lectures on, on linguistics very much here. Mm. Anyway, yes, John Lyons accepted me to do the one-year MA in um, uh, Edinburgh, and I got a grant, so I, I, I went to Edinburgh and, and did this one-year MA course there. John Lyons, of course, among his many books, wrote the Fontana Modern Masters on Chomsky. Um, was he lecturing on Chomsky? Perhaps? Yes, he was. I mean, the lectures I had from John Lyons here in Cambridge mm -hmm. were on Chomsky, and then he did some more on Chomsky when we were uh, studying in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. Chomsky is mixed up, of course, again with that period, with the Vietnam War as well which was just happening when you were here. Yes, that's right. Um, did the two get mixed at, at all in your life? I mean, in other words, you weren't politically active when you were at Cambridge. Uh, not active in the sense of actually doing anything. Mm. Um, we used to talk about it all the time, of course, mm. and we felt we were mm. part of the anti-war movement and so mm. on, but I, I'm afraid I was never um, mm. one who actually did anything about it. I, I remember by the time I got to Edinburgh, um, I remember taking part in demonstrations. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, the South African rugby tour. Mm. I remember um, demonstrating against that, but I was, uh, I'm afraid I've never been very much of an activist. Mm. But lots of, lots of very strong ideas about what ought to happen, <laughs> but I've never done anything uh, about it, except in later life, now I can afford it, I do send money mm. <laughs> to causes I support. What, what was the subject of your PhD? At well, um, I had a, another interesting experience here, just before I, just after I graduated, but before I left, in um, Heifer's Bookshop, I came across a book called Sociolinguistics, with a hyphen. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, I don't know why I thought, you know, some kind of social engagement of linguistics would be interesting, but perhaps it had to do with the, the politics of the time. Um, and I bought the book, it was by Arthur Capel, uh, and it was very much an, an anthropological take on sociolinguistics. And I found that a bit disappointing. I mean, it was interesting, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So um, in Edinburgh, I then had another bookshop experience during my first year, of doing, during my year of the MA there. And I came across a book called Sociolinguistics Without a Hyphen, edited by William Bright, which was the proceedings of a conference, which had been held a couple of years earlier at UCLA in California. And there was a collection of excellent papers in there, including one by William Lebove, hmm. Bill Lebove. And I, that really captured my imagination. I thought it was, it was about the um, social mobility up and down and its effect on linguistic behavior with numbers. He'd actually counted things. And I thought, well, that's really very fascinating. And one week, John Lyons gave us the task of writing an essay as part of the MA course on anything we liked. So I wrote a course, I wrote an essay on uh, sociolinguistics, on this particular aspect of sociolinguistics. And he said, well, this is really interesting. He said, I didn't know anything about this. 
I mean, not only was linguistics quite new, but sociolinguistics was unheard of. And I said, well, that's, I think it's really interesting. And then I discovered that Lebov, I mean, he's often called Lebov, but he mm. calls himself Lebov in the American way, that uh, Lebov had done this um, PhD study of the English spoken in New York City, the social stratification of English in New York City. And I got that book at enormous expense, and I thought this was absolutely fascinating. It was an urban dialect study where he tried to bear in mind that you can't really do a, an urban dialect study by just taking one person mm. and investigating their speech. And um, so I, encouraged by John Lyon's suggestion that my essays were quite good, I actually then asked him if I could stay on in, do, in Edinburgh and do a PhD. And he said, yes. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I wanted to, I've been inspired by Le Beauf and I wanted to do something rather like that. And he said, yes, yes. So, I mean, I, you know, I applied officially. So um, there I was, I was going to do an urban dialect study in Britain. And I thought, well, I'm in Edinburgh. I suppose I have to do it in Edinburgh. And I was a bit worried about that because uh, it wasn't an environment, you know. Scotland was quite a foreign country to English people in those days. And I wasn't quite sure that I had enough knowledge about Scots and whether I could do it right or not. Explaining about Edinburgh and uh, the beginnings of your PhD. Yes, I. my assumption was that the natural thing for a student at Edinburgh University to do would be to study Edinburgh speech. And as I say, I had some misgivings about that. So one day, uh, Keith Brown, uh, who was later a, a colleague of mine in, in, in uh, Essex, E.K. Brown, one of the lecturers on the MA course in Edinburgh, said to me, well, why don't you do an urban dialect study of Norwich? That's where you're from. And I said, oh yes. Why not? I can do that. <laughs> One of the many things which never occurred to me. There was all sorts of things that should have occurred to me in my ac academic life, but didn't. Uh, and I only have myself to blame. But anyway, thanks to him, um, I spent three years doing a PhD thesis um, on the urban dialect of Norwich. And it was eventually published with the title The Social Differentiation of English in Norwich. And so I was inspired by Le Beauf, And I followed some of his methodology. Um, but it turned out, totally unbeknown to me, to be the first sociolinguistic urban dialect survey and study of any um, dialect in, in the British Isles, really. I had no, I mean, it was quite groundbreaking, but I must say I had no idea that it was mm. at the time. Who was your supervisor? Well, there was a difficulty because nobody had done anything like this before. Mm. I, was, I was really the first person to do anything in this kind of sociolinguistics at all in this country. What I should have done is write to Le Beauf. But that never occurred to me either, and I would have been far too diffident to do that. So I was supervised to start with by John Lyons. But then he said, I don't know anything about this. So he gave me two supervisors. One was called Bill Jones, who was a, uh, a dialectologist, um, had done work on Yorkshire dialect. And another, the other was uh, Jim Mather, who was part of the survey of Scottish dialects. But they didn't know anything about what I was doing either. I mean, they were good dialectologists and they were intelligent and helpful, but I pretty much wrote it by myself. And it shows, I have to say. What was the difference? I mean, to explain it for a general public, it would seem within the field, if someone is a good dialectologist in Scotland, why can't he understand the differences in dialects between different groups in Norwich? Well, the, the whole methodology was very different. Um, it was a revolution that Le Beauf introduced, really. And uh, the idea was that um, you couldn't write a proper description of the speech of a large urban area by just taking one person, one informant, and, and um, recording them and analysing their speech, which is what traditional dialectologists had normally done investigating rural dialects. You go to a, a, a village and you find uh, preferably some older person there who speaks um, a 
conservative form of the local dialect and you interview them and you, you describe what you hear from this person and that's it. So um, my thesis was based on the randoms. I took a random sample of the population of the city. I went round and asked if I could interview them. Um, I recorded the interviews and then I spent a whole year listening to the tapes and analysing them and counting them. Counting things which were variable. That's the, the innovation which Lebov had introduced. So um, a study which most people know about is his study of the pronunciation of R in, in New York City English. So whether the R was pronounced in cart and farm and bird, as is typical of most American English, or whether it was omitted, cart and farm and bird, as is typical of New York City and typical of you and me and, and most English people. And what he discovered was that it was variable. Some people pronounced most of their R's in, the, in words of that sort. Some people uh, dropped most of them. Um, but if you actually counted how many, R, how many times people said uh, car and how many times they said car, then you found that that correlated with social class. So upper class people pronounced most of the R's and lower class people didn't pronounce most of the R's and in between people were in between. Of course that, that, it was much more sophisticated than that but that was the sort of thing that I started doing and then looked at the patterns uh, that, we, that were to be uh, uncovered in that material. I'm trying to remember, his name escaped me entirely, but there was a famous study about this time on restricted and complex grammatical structures in London. This is Basil Bernstein. Basil Bernstein, yes. And um, the two terms he introduced were restricted code mm. and elaborated mm. code. And there was an enormous controversy between people like him and people like Lebov and me. Um, mostly, I think, because his work was misunderstood, although I have to say that it's not surprising his work was misunderstood because it's very hard to understand, very mm. opaque. And the thing that it took me some time to understand was that he wasn't really talking about language at all. I mean, his, his, he, what he said was that um, people of a, of a working class background in places like London were at a linguistic disadvantage because of the way they spoke. He did not mean anything to do with their accent, he did not mean anything to do with their dialect. But it was misunderstood by educational psychologists, particularly in the United States, who took him to be saying that um, working class children were verbally deprived. You know, they couldn't think properly because they, they didn't have the right kind of language, which was absolute and com complete and pernicious nonsense. Uh, but what he was saying, uh, and he, he did, I mean, unfortunately, I do blame him for talking about um, actual linguistic characteristics. He talked about relative clauses and pronouns and so on, which he didn't know anything about really. But basically, there was, when he says restricted code, it's a very useful notion. It means when people um, take background information for granted, um, when they shouldn't. I mean, you're familiar with this from small children. Mm. Small children will come up to you and start talking about somebody and assume that everybody in the world knows who Michael is when mm. actually people don't. Um, so he was saying that people who are used to moving in different social circles, who are geographically mobile, socially mobile, um, they're used to supplying the precisely correct amount of background information when they're talking to other people. And people who live in more restricted uh, social groups don't do that when sometimes it would be a good idea if they did. That's, that's what it boils down they, to. They really. could. They, they had the ability to do it, but they did, just didn't need to. Well, they didn't need to in their normal everyday lives and therefore put them in a situation where they did need to and they, they carried on not doing it. Well, that, mm. that was his suggestion mm. anyway. So, yes, that wasn't sociolinguistics. It wasn't linguistics. It was about... But it was language and stratification. Then. It was language and stratification but it was, he was interested in, in what people said, mm. whereas linguists are interested in how people say things, which is not the same thing at all. Mm. So, um, if you had to, again, Desert Island Discs, if, if you were allowed to say which of your 
theories, which three of your theories or books you were most attached to and felt had been your greatest contribution to? I suppose, I mean, my, as I say, my PhD thesis was hardly a bestseller, mm. obviously, but it, it, it's still referred to. Mm. Um, and that's because it was the first, the social differentiation of English and Norwich. Um, and I think it was probably the, the second only study in the world published in that kind of paradigm after Lebeau's New York City book. Um, people also know me because of my, I always call it the Penguin book, it was called Social Linguistics and Introduction. It came out in 1974. It was the first ever uh, introductory book on social linguistics. And it's still being used as a, as a textbook in colleges and universities. It's in, I don't know, I've lost count of the editions, but it, mm. it's come out. So um, I guess that's been uh, useful. And another book that made a bit of a splash was a book that came out in 1975 called Accent, Dialect and the School, where I was putting forward perfectly straightforward orthodox views from the point of view of linguists namely that all accents and dialects are equal and there's nothing wrong with them as such and that teachers should pay attention to the language that children take into the classroom. There's, there's an echo there, you see, in my experience with my school teacher mm. who didn't understand rude, rude and road. Mm. That teachers need to know about their children's accents and their dialects if they're going to successfully uh, teach them. So uh, that was quite controversial because people said uh, Trudgill was uh, trying to get everybody to use bad grammar and all Trudgill was saying was it's not bad grammar, it's just different grammar. Uh, and that was, that was actually, I think, I like to think it was an important book because it was adopted in many teacher training colleges. Mm. And we all thought, well, great, there's that battle won, but it's a battle which has to be fought in every generation. I think we're still back to, we're back to square one again now. <laughs> I don't think Michael Gove would agree with me whatsoever about this even though he's wrong and I'm right. <laughs> um, but in, as far as these sort of more theoretical books are concerned, there are three, I think. The first one came out in 1986, and it's called Dialects in Contact. There'd been lots of work previously on languages in contact. What happens where one language comes into contact with another? In the case of bilingual individuals, bilingual communities, what influence can one language have on another, historically speaking? But I was interested in um, all sorts of situations where different dialects of the same language come into contact with one another. And I, de I developed particular theories about what sort of things happen. Like you, you tend to get a bit of simplification. Um, and I got particularly interested in what happens when a whole new, a whole new dialect develops. I and mean, a good example, I suppose, would be Milton Keynes. Mm -hmm. You know, you have an area where there's very few people living, and then large numbers of people come from all over Britain, bringing their different dialects and accents with them, and they establish a new community. What's their English going to be like? I didn't actually talk about uh, Milton Keynes, although my uh, friend and colleague Paul Kurzweil subsequently has very interesting work. It's a nice laboratory for mm. doing work on dialect contact. But then that led on to, I think, the book which I perhaps most enjoyed writing, and that's my 2004 book, which is called New Dialect Formation, uh, The Inevitability of Colonial Englishes. And I developed this colonial theory... Colonial Englishness. Colonial Englishes, yes, Englishes. meaning types of English. Mm. This is mm. a neologism which people in the trade know use. We talk about Englishes. Mm. Um, yes, I'm not sure I'm happy with it, but anyway, that's what mm. people say. And. This came about because I was invited to work on a research project in New Zealand by my friend and colleague Elizabeth Gordon, who was very interested, like many people are, in why is New Zealand English like it is? Mm. You could say the same thing about Australian, about American and Canadian English. You know, you take people from the British Isles and you plonk them down in New Zealand, where English had never been spoken before, and eventually a whole new variety of English grows up, which is recognisably from New Zealand. And how did that happen? And she, um, being a good social networker, being a true New Zealander, New Zealand being a rather small country population-wise, discovered that the New Zealand Broadcasting Corporation had an archive 
of recordings that had been made during the 1940s of elderly New Zealanders. Um, they started off making recordings on a, it was called the Mobile Recording Unit. And they used to drive around New Zealand and interview people in particular communities. People would sing songs, they'd tell stories, um, they would um, relate their life history. And then these programs were originally, um, the recordings were originally for individuals to, to send messages to their family overseas, their sons and daughters who were serving overseas in the war. But in the late 1940s, they went over to just broadcasting programs, a bit like the BBC program Down Your Way, mm. which you and I remember. <laughs> um, and so there there were all these recordings made of people who were in their 90s, in their 80s, in their 70s in New Zealand. And of course, emigration from the British Isles to New Zealand didn't really get underway until the 1840s. So the first large number of native Anglophones in New Zealand didn't start being born until about 1850s. So some of these people on these recordings were amongst the very first people in New Zealand to speak English. And what did they speak like? So Elizabeth got the recordings, they were re-recorded, they were digitized, and she got grants for them to be studied. And she wanted me to be in on it because I knew about British Isles dialects of English, and I'd also done theoretical work on dialects in contact. So for many years, I, I flew out to New Zealand I, I tried to arrange to go in February, for obvious <laughs> reasons, and listen to these tapes. And they were, listening to them for the first time was absolutely astonishing. Because here, they, here were these people who'd lived all their lives in New Zealand, and here was me listening to tape recordings of them. And what did they sound like? Well, they didn't sound like anything at all, really. They didn't sound like each other. And they certainly didn't sound like New Zealanders. And they sounded a bit English and a bit Scottish and a bit Irish and a bit West Country and a bit North of England and so on. And you, I gradually came to understand that these people spoke, each of them spoke a mixed dialect. But they'd, they'd all come up with different individual mixtures. So I, I gradually developed this theory about new dialect formation. Um, and I came up with the idea that it was very deterministic, that if you knew enough about it, if you knew enough about what the input to the dialect, the new dialect mixture was, you know, how many people there were from London, how many people there were from, uh, from, from Bristol or whatever, you would be able to predict what the new dialect was going to be like. Um, and it was, you know, only in the next generation that you start getting a recognisable form of, of uh, New Zealand English. So. It's a rather strong claim to make, and many people have poo-pooed it, but um, I think nobody's actually been able to, to disprove it. It's probably not provable or disprovable. Can but you work backwards? In other uh, words, from the dialect that currently exists, can you work out how many Londoners... Because there's all this theory about you know, EastEnders going to Australia from the present estuary English of bits of Australia. So could, does your theory work both forwards predictably and backwards at all? Well, I mean, it. it, it um, I don't think it does because um, what you can say is that um, you know some people. Just to take an example, some people in England say wanted and horses, and some people say wanted and horses. Mm. Um, now, New Zealanders say wanted and horses. Why is this? Um, you know, Londoners say wanted and horses. Mm. So. If there were very large numbers of Londoners um, who went to New Zealand, well, why don't New Zealanders say that? Because they, they, they're often said to resemble Cockney in the way they speak, mm. but not in that respect. Well, I mean, I think the answer is that there were, there were more people from other parts of the British Isles who said wanted and horses for that to be the form which won the day. So people in East Anglia say wanted and horses, people in Ireland say wanted and horses, and so on in other parts mm. of the British Isles. So, I mean, you, you, could, you could hazard a guess if you wanted to work backwards, but you would, um, you would need to know, uh, uh, you would need to know, you know where, the, where the original settlers came from. And it's not so much a matter of the number of people as the, uh, as the, the number of competing dialect forms. Hmm. And 
how many of them there were. But anyway, that that is something I'm pleased with and something that people are still working with and, and trying to apply to different situations, uh, different examples of new dialects being formed. People have applied it to um, Canadian English, for example. Does it work there? So it's people have started thinking. And then on my Desert Island Discs, the, the most recent book um, mm. and that came out uh, at the just at the end of last year, 2011, is my book, um, which is called Sociolinguistic Typology, uh, Social Determinants of Linguistic Complexity. It looks very optimistic to me, but uh, to, I mean, the, having read the summary, but tell, tell us what it's about. Well, the idea is that when I first started studying linguistics here in Cambridge, one of the things that John Lyons and everybody was very keen to point out to us was that all languages are highly complex. And I think in those days anyway, maybe today still, you need to tell lay people that. And of course we were lay people as beginning students. Because there was the idea that some, you know, some languages are just primitive and, and they're not as good as uh, French or English, not such developed languages. So it, you need to make the, the case that all languages are highly complex systems. And it doesn't matter whether they're spoken in Papua New Guinea or metropolitan Paris. But then it went a bit further than that because we, there was this message that um, all languages are equally complex. And that very first linguistics textbook that I saw lying on the table over there in the Modern Languages Library actually had that particular message in it. All languages are equally complex. And if something happens in one part of the language to simplify it, there will be a compensatory complexification somewhere else. Um, so that was a, a frequently, and it's still uh, um, a message which is sometimes put across. All languages are equally complex. Now, sociolinguists and people working on t contact find it hard to accept that. In fact, they know it's wrong because one of the things which happens in language contact and in dialect contact is that the languages get simplified. Now, that's not a value-loaded term at all. We're not saying getting worse or um, or less adequate. It's just to do with the, the structure and it has to do with the, the way I, the, the route I've taken to studying linguistic complexity is how hard is it for an adult to learn as a foreigner, as a non-native speaker? Because obviously small children will learn anything. Mm. But adults are not very good, adults and adolescents are not very good language learners and they get things wrong and they can't remember things and they'll miss out things if they're not important. And the sort of things which cause difficulty for adults when they're learning a new language are things like irregularity. You know, you remember when you were learning French or whatever, you had to sit down and remember those irregular verbs. Of course, native French-speaking children didn't have to do that. They just got the hang of it as they went along. Um, so, uh, in situations of uh, dialect contact, new dialect formation, you tend to see complexities like that disappear. And that also happens in situations of language contact. In if, um, if you take Afrikaans, for example, I mean, we know that Afrikaans is a variety of Dutch that was taken to South Africa, but has been enormously influenced by the fact that it's been learnt by massive numbers of adult non-native speakers. Okay, so, um, Afrikaans, perfectly adequate language, perfectly normal language, but if you compare it to Dutch, it's simpler, it's more regular, and it has other forms of uh, uh, simplification that have gone on, and you can say that those forms of simplification are due to the fact that um, uh, not only have adults learnt it um, as a foreign language, but their foreigner languages had an effect because of demographic factors on the language of the the mainstream native speaking community. So if you like uh, um, people today, th there's a sense in which native speakers of Afrikaans today are native speakers of some non-native variety of, of Dutch. So um, it's obvious that if a language can get simpler through time, if the same language can be more or less simple at different points in time, then different languages can be more or less simple at the same point of time. So some languages are simpler than others. Uh, they're more they're more regular. They have less 
redundancy, they have less grammatical agreement, they have less expression of grammatical categories through grammatical means rather than lexical means, and so on. So, um, what I've been trying to do in this book is work out what we can say about simplicity and complexity in languages from that sociolinguistic point of view. And what I've realized is that um, languages which have been subjected to lots of adult language learning through language contact tend to be simpler. Languages, on the other hand, which have been subjected to a different type of, of contact uh, will turn out differently. So if you put two or more languages together and leave them together for many centuries in the same geographical area um, so that people become bilingual, so that children become bilingual. So, and there's lots of places in the world where this, is, where this is true. So you find languages influencing each other, even though they're not necessarily very closely related. So, uh, well, a, a well-known area in Europe is the Balkans. So there are very many similarities between uh, Albanian and Greek and Ru Romanian and uh, Macedonian, Bulgarian, um, even though they're not closely related. And over the centuries, they've grown more like each other because of the large numbers of people who are bilingual or trilingual in, in, in these languages. So in, in that situation, languages can get more complex because they'll start borrowing stuff from other languages. So there's two different types of language contact, those which adult language contact, which produces simplification, and then long-term co-territorial um, centuries old perhaps bilingual situations where children have been learning the other languages which can lead to complexification because people have borrowed stuff from other languages so then that leaves you with the question well yeah all right but where did complexity come from in the first place um, and the the answer obviously has to be well it doesn't happen in any type of contact situation because on the one hand you'll get simplification on the other hand you'll get um, additive complexity where you take already existing complexity and add it to your own language so in what sort of community do you get linguistic complexification developing and to cut a long story short my answer is you get that you're more likely to get it in small relatively isolated communities with not very much language contact with a large amount of shared information with dense social networks where nothing happens to destabilize that community for many generations and that allows for various sorts of linguistic changes to take place which will produce irregularity um, which will produce new grammatical categories and so on so the, the, my feeling is that if you leave languages alone they will gradually get more and more complex I mean that's what naturally happens to languages um, and it's only if you start getting large-scale language contact, large-scale social upheaval, that you'll get simplification coming in. So, if we, if we want to know where lang linguistic complexity came from, we say it came from small, stable communities with low contact. And those sorts of communities are getting fewer and fewer. And so, my prediction would be that we're going to get less and less linguistic complexity in the languages of the world. And uh, the, the moral of that is that if we want to know as linguists what the human fa language faculty is like, what the, what the possibilities of human languages are, we need to go out um, and study languages spoken in small communities, in places like the Amazon jungle, in Papua New Guinea, in the Himalayas. We need to study the languages of these communities before they disappear because it looks like they're going to in one of the biggest tragedies to befall human culture. And the languages that are going to be left behind are going to be relatively simple and they're going to be very atypical of how human languages have been throughout human history. So the languages that people are going to be studying in future centuries will not tell them anything at all about what languages used to be like 10,000 years ago. That's fascinating and very relevant to what I'm doing with Mark Turin on the World Oral Literature Project, which is trying to record and document these very small, isolated languages all over the world, of which there seems no, not much interest 
generally. I mean, there is interest, but there's not much money. But it ties in very well with that. So it does. Um, I was thinking that in a way, it's a sort of anti-Darwinian ar- argument, um, at least on the surface. That is that. I would imagine that Darwin would think that a small inbreeding community cut off from the world would over time become simpler rather than more complex because um, it would all tend towards the the middle and variation would be lost in such a population. I mean, I may be wrong, but I would have guessed that would be the case. Now, if that's right, that biologically you would expect that, um, what you hinted at was that language in such communities is used for many different um, purposes. For instance, for network formations, for political power, for all sorts of things. So if the load on language is very high because it's a small oral community cut off and it's being used in kinship and politics and all sphere and ritual and religion, then the, the language becomes more complex to bear the burden of having to do so much in a small restricted area. Is that tied up at all with what you are? Well, not really, I have to say, because yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me that um, th- this, this development of this particular sort of uh, complexity that I'm thinking about seems to be just something that happens regardless of the function to which the language is put. Mm. Um, it, it 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 doesn't have any benefit, um, and it it doesn't have. There's no disbenefit if the languages get simpler. Com- complex doesn't mean better. It doesn't mean worse. It just means more complex, and it does mean more difficult for for adults to learn. But you know, so what? It it doesn't matter if adults find a language particularly difficult to learn. So I I don't actually see any connection with. Um, the uses to which languages to which languages are are put, obviously, the sorts of factors that you mentioned will have a, a direct impact on the vocabulary of the language. Mm. If it's being used for ritual, if it's being used for political power, and all those things which you quite rightly mentioned, yes, um, a, a vocabulary will develop which is appropriate to that. So you could have a larger and more complex vocabulary. So you're quite right. But I think I haven't said anything very much in my book at all about vocabulary because I, I don't know much about it. And in one sense, it's really rather obvious and uninteresting. Okay, well, the the Sami in northern Norway have large numbers of words for snow. Well, yes, of course they do, and because it's useful to have large numbers of words for snow. But I'm more intrigued by the, the syntactic structure, the, uh, the grammatical structure of sentences, the grammatical structure of words, and by the phonological systems, the sound systems, um, and how they come to be like they are. Why are they like they are? And um, and I, as I say, I think all communities at one period in human history would have had really rather complex linguistic systems. Um, and the way they get less complex is because of uh, language contact and larger communities. And that raises the interesting question: you know, why are languages so complex? Now, what's the point of this linguistic complexity? And there doesn't seem to be much point, really. Um, uh, a very brilliant Swedish linguist called Ersten Dahl has talked about linguistically cross-linguistically dispensable phenomena. So things which languages don't need. And if you start thinking about it, languages don't need most of the things that many languages have. So what's the point of a grammatical gender? English used to have grammatical gender, but we lost it. Mm. What, what, what consequences did that have? Well, none whatsoever. So why do French and German and uh, Italian and Greek, why do they preserve masculine, feminine, neuter, or just masculine and feminine? What's the point of taking nouns and grouping them together in, in different classes which behave differently? Well, I mean, there are some advantages from time to time, but mostly well, they're just there, and they, and they seem to be just things which happen. It's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, what, what's the point of having irregular verbs? I mean, if you were starting a language from scratch, if you were inventing a language from scratch, you would never invent a language where the present tense verb is go and the past tense is went. I mean, 
It's just silly, isn't it, really? Mm. So it, it, these things happen. And if you let languages go long enough without interfering with them, that's the sort of thing which happens. But whether there's any point, I don't know. And whether it has, it has anything to do with the functions that the language is used for in a particular community, I don't know. But it, So what's interesting about it is it tells us what the nature of human language is like, and it tells us what perhaps what the nature of the human language faculty is like. And it tells us that human beings will learn and use, given good enough opportunity to learn the language when they're small children, learn languages with enormous amounts of complexity. I mean, there must be a limit to how much complexity there can be. So perhaps this is a different way of looking at the uh, study of the human brain to the way in which Chomsky and his type of linguists have been trying to do it. I, I don't know. Just nearly at the end, but I was just going to ask you about your family background. Um, people often suddenly remember they haven't remembered some important person like their children or their spouse or something. Is there anyone else um, you should mention? Well, I would like to mention my spouse, yeah. <laughs> um, my wife Jean is American, as I think I already mentioned, and she's in linguistics as well, which I must say has been a, a, a joy to me because we can, you know, we, we um, she's not doing any research, um, but you know we can talk about uh, the same things. We share the same values when it comes to language, and everything, every single thing I write, uh, she reads, and uh, she corrects and improves. So it's pr uh, boringly predictable. Whenever you see anything written by me, you will always say in the acknowledgments, uh, "Many thanks to Jean Hannah uh, for helping me in one way or the other." And we. Uh, we met um, at the University of Illinois in the uh, summer of 1978 when I was invited to teach on the Linguistic Society of America summer school over there. So I have to say that's a very, that's one other highly important linguistic event which happened to me. The professor there, Braj Kacharu, who's a sociolinguist, invited me, I was fairly young at the time, to go and be one of the visiting faculty on this summer school, six week summer school in Champaign-Urbana, and Jean was one of the um, graduate students there, and the graduate students were told that they had to look after the visiting faculty, and uh, Jean looked after me, and she's been looking after me ever since, and we were this perfect combination. She had a, a car and no money, and I had, a, I had money and no car, and after the summer school was over, we set off on a three-week trip all the way around the United States, and I think she drove 6,000 miles in three weeks, something like that. But um, So we've never looked back, and in fact we have written a, a linguistics book together, which is called International English, which is designed to be used by foreigners learning English at a rather advanced level, um, although I think it is used by native speakers now as well, and the idea is to point out differences between the main uh, national varieties of English. So what, you know, the core of the book is what are the differences between American English and English English? Mm. And since she's American and since I'm English, um, we had a very good start in doing that. And we, st and something very interesting actually, still even today after we've been uh, together now for uh, getting on for 35 years, even now, uh, there'll be a word that Jean will use that I've never heard before and don't know what it means, and vice versa. And there may be some usage that I've never heard before, and I say, do you really say that? And then, of course, being academics, we write it down. So th that gives you an interesting insight into how, how much we know, how much is in here, but how very rarely we sometimes use some of that uh, knowledge. But, yeah, we, have a, we share a love of language and an interest in language, and that's been very nice. That's a very nice point to end. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much.